Let's stand and sing, Brethren, we have met to worship. She's had a busy weekend, I bet. So this morning I'm going to ask you a question. I know you're going to have lots of answers because this is a great question. Okay? So think first before you go blurdy smurties, okay? All right. So we're going to think about what is something we do for other people that's good? <gasps> Being kind. Sharing, it's a good one. <coughs> Helpful. And listen, yes, all good answers. Now, think about your answers you just gave me. And think about, is God happy with you when you do those things? <laughs> us when we are kind. Right, Bella? Isn't God happy with us when we're good to other people? He sure is. He wants us to be good and do good things. 
No. Yes, ma'am. He doesn't. You're right. That was going to be my next thing. He don't like it when we don't listen. That's why he gave us the Bible. That's right, because God wants us to do all those things. And then, and then, when we're being good, that's true too. Perfect. They don't need me. <laughs> they got this. You're right. All those are good things. When we care, God, he does love us. He doesn't let us out of his sight. Yes, we were, you talked about that in Sunday school today. Okay, can Yes. Okay, let's come back together in one minute, and we'll wrap this up, okay? So, God is happy with us when we do good, right? And that is being kind. We talked about that. Didn't we talk about being kind to others? Very good. Then, to wrap it all up, even when we do all those good things, He wants us, this is a big word, to do it and walk humbly with Him. That means when you do something nice for somebody, you don't have to go tell everybody in this church what a good person you are. Because guess what? They're going to see it and they're going to know it. Can we pray? Dear Lord, we come to you today. And man, we are so thankful for these children. And while we try to give them words, sometimes they have the words. And we are thankful for them. We are thankful for their sweethearts. And we pray that you will be with them every day this week and in every moment. And we know you are. And help them to see that. In your sweet name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see all these children here this morning. And Welcome to worship. It's good to take uh, this time out together as a community of faith and to take time to worship the Lord, draw near to Him so that uh, He can change our hearts and our minds. And that is our desire today, that, um, that our desires become God's desires and vice versa. So, Welcome. And today, after worship, we're going to have our Super Bowl luncheon, our Women's Missionary Union doing their fundraiser. Uh, lots of y'all have brought soups and, and things to go along with that. So after we finish here, you can just go right through this door and right over and put your money in there, however much you want to. Lots of zeros on the ends of your checks. And, and, uh, and eat some soup. And that, that'll be our first fruits uh, experience this, this, this month. There'll be no six o'clock service tonight since we're having this uh, fundraising luncheon here today. The money goes, our local uh, WMU uses that throughout the year to uh, support the mission projects that they, that they do. Uh, so support them today at our Super Bowl luncheon. Take time to read the other announcements and things scheduled for the week in your bulletin. We're just glad to be here in these moments to worship the Lord this morning. So let's stand and greet those that worship around you. Welcome.
Oh, how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit, in faith and unity, where the bonds of peace, of acceptance and love are the fruit of His presence here among us. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out His word till the whole earth sees the Redeemer has come, for He dwells in Oh, how good it is on this journey we share to rejoice with the happy and weep with those who mourn for the weak find strength, the afflicted find grace when we offer the blessing of belonging. So with all He dwells in the presence of His people.
Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful through times we have failed you, selfish in thought and uncaring in deed, foolish in word and ungrateful. Spirit of God, conquer our hearts with love that flows from forgiveness. Cause us to yield and return to the mercy of God. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, to keep us from falling, guiding our ways with your fatherly heart, growing our faith with each testing. God speak a day, struggles will end, faultless will gaze on your Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. And we ask, Lord, that you will be with those of us that aren't able to be here with us today, that you will watch over them that are traveling, Lord, that are sick. And, Lord, we ask that you will take our tithes and our offerings and that you will use them for the honor and glory of your kingdom. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Let's continue worship in prayer together, please. Gracious Lord, we are thankful to gather here to worship you today. We're thankful for those good gifts in life, Lord, for family, for friendships, for the fun things that we get to do. Lord, we give you thanks for all these things. Father, we acknowledge that uh, often our desires aren't your desires. We are overcome by the pressure of this world or the stress or anxiety that's within us. And we just ask for your deliverance, Lord, from these things, that you bring us more and more into that place of peace, a place of deep peace in your presence, Father. You have shared with us the way, the truth, and the life. Let that soak in deep and change who we are that we might minister to this world, to those friends and family around us. Lord, we thank you for our community that we live in. We pray for all people here today, other believers that are in worship, for uh, folks in and about town and throughout the countryside here that uh, may or may not know you. But we're thankful to be here in your presence in these moments. So let us hear, Lord, what is good, what is right in your eyes, and change our hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Jay. And choir, what a beautiful song, beautifully done. And the kind of confirmation or affirmation I need this morning as I just reflect even for a half a moment about the age differences in the hall this morning, as, as is every Sunday, much less the uh, baggage with which we come into this place and the baggage I hope that we'll unpack and carry out from this place and uh, who we are in this world today. I'm, I'm excited to be with you and know that I can only stand here by the grace of God because of his love, because what he has done to forgive me and, uh, and you, by the way, and it's a good thing. This uh, passage this morning is a part of a series this time of year in what they call Epiphany. And that's uh, simply an unveiling or a recognition or a, uh, a, um, an epiphany, <laughs> a coming of an awareness of who Jesus Christ is as, uh, as God revealed to us in this world. And we've been in the Old Testament for um, much of this season of epiphany, well, all of it. And it's interesting to see Jesus revealed in the Old Testament. Sometimes you can press that a little too far. But uh, it's safe to say that God has re revealed himself to us in Jesus and everything we find about him in both the uh, covenants, both books, the, uh, the Hebrew Bible as well as the Christian Bible, and all of it put together uh, can lead us closer to who God is. That being said, sometimes that's not without challenge. Uh, and in fact, the greatest challenge that I'm experiencing from God recently is not so much um, the uh, sense of judgment or something like that. It is, in fact, the confrontation of his grace and mercy that really seems to cause the most problem in people's lives and indeed challenges me the most. So let's hear this text from Micah chapter 6. It's um, beginning in verse 1, and we'll ramp up, and you'll see how it climaxes in verse 8. Here we go, Micah chapter 6, verse 1. Hear now what the Lord, verse 1 there, I don't know, let's see if we can find, there it is. Hear now what the Lord is saying, you got it, thank you. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. It's so interesting to have lawyers in the room and realize that this is a courtroom setting. That, that the metaphor is that's going on here. Plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Now, I don't know. You can make a jury up of a lot of different things, but the mountains and the hills? Sounds earth shattering, doesn't it? Um, let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. My people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, that is, to lead them out of Egypt. My people, remember how what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. And from Shittim to Gilgal, that you might know the righteous acts of God. Case is left pending just a little bit here. We might call it, I don't know if this is proper terminology or not, but we might call it a sidebar. And verse 6, they approach the bench. With what shall I come to the Lord? The man asks, Israel asks. Verse 6, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams? Ten thousands rivers of oil. Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts? Think about that one. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Well, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to 
do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Simple and as difficult as all that. Bow with me for prayer. Lord God, help us to hear it this morning with fresh ears that this is a revelation of your goodness and grace, your intention for a good world. And you've made it very plain to us how uh, we can live and begin to walk into and to live into the kingdom that you brought to earth in Jesus Christ. Fill us with that sense of presence, I pray, as you send your spirit upon us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We've already mentioned that this is Epiphany and this is a metaphor of the courtroom that's going on here. And verse 8, I believe, is certainly the, the key enough verse for me to read it again for you right now. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. We're going to talk about justice, mercy, or kindness and uh, the humble walk a little bit, but there are so many other things preceding this, we, we have to uh, give attention to the whole passage. And what's more, verse 8 in particular begins with this statement, He has told you, O man, what is good. And I couldn't help but stop and think, what is good? Now that can be a question. In fact, I titled the message that way, but I didn't put an exclamation point or a question mark. But we found a question mark, and then I put an exclamation point. Because... What is good? What is good? It can be a statement either way. And I want you to think about that as we try to decide and discern how we can walk into the good that God desires. I hope you have an abiding conviction that God wants good for his world. I heard, yeah, I heard that. He desire, that's what he desires for this world, for this creation, for you in your life is good. I ran into a woman this week and, and um, she shared with, uh, with me at, uh, at a meal that, uh, uh, that uh, she was just, I guess it was a frustration or, or a profound hurt and not quite despair maybe, but she was saying, my kids just don't get it. I don't know parents if any of you have ever said that. She, she said, they don't understand that everything I'm doing and you can fill in the blanks with that. I, I filled it in as working my fingers to the bone. Everything I'm doing is for them. And they don't get it. Now, kids, I'm not just bashing teens or children or students. Um, we have to grow up to get these things. And I, listen, young people, I guarantee you there are many adults that don't get it either. Okay? So feel comforted a little bit there. But she was sharing this question, and I heard that question in what God said. In, as we read it back there in verse 3, and we'll come to it again. Uh, um, what have I done to cause you to act this way? That's how he framed that. So the first thing for us to grasp a hold of, the first um, strategy, if you want to call it that, for us to live into the good that God desires for our lives is we need to realize that this is not just a, a dusty old story from Micah from uh, 800, 700, uh, 600 BC, but this is a matter that affects people today because not only did God have this relationship trouble with Israel, but parents have this relationship trouble today with people. And you know what I'd bet? I bet God has this kind of problem with us today too. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've rebelled enough that he said to me, you know, John, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done for you to feel this way? Now, this uh, whole question of good um, really went deep into my heart as I thought about the whole thing. He said, what is good? And where's the first time you find the word good in the Bible, do you think? Genesis chapter 1. And not once, but... Six times, right? He creates something from nothing. And he looks at it and says, well, that's good, right? And he created a place for plants and animals to grow. And he said, that's good. And he created a place where the sun and the moon and the stars and everything would abide. And he said, that's good. Then he created the animals and the plants. And that's good. I don't know, what am I up to four now <laughs> or five? And... And finally, after creating human beings, he said, 
That's very good. Then he rested. From the beginning, God has created a good world. But our fall into envy and pride and all that that brings with us hurts God's heart because you know what? He's still saying right from creation on. In fact, everything that God has been doing since the fall has been for us. Just like this lady was saying, don't they understand I'm doing this for them? And so I think we have to first, if we're going to get anywhere this morning, we have to realize that this story is a present day story. This is a a story for now. This is something that's real and immediate, and this happens with us now. How do we learn to walk in the good that that God desires? We learn that this is the story for the present day. Now, there's something of, I'm going to just call it a subpoena for lack of a better word. I'm pretty sure that technically that's not right, and I imagine I can get schooled on that later by some folks that can tell me about it. But it feels like a subpoena that, that Micah presents. He says, all right, Israel, come on up here and plead your case. You've you've been summoned. Maybe it's a summons. I don't know. You can help me with that. Uh, You have been summoned to come plead your case and explain what God has uh, done wrong or right. And God is going to come and he's going to plead his case. And he does. Justice can be delayed no longer. God will be silent no longer. And God and the people of Israel meet in the courtroom, which is the mountains and the hills and the, and the foundations of the earth. As I said, this is of earth shattering importance. This is something that really, you know, I, I, I don't like conflict. How about you? You know, I mean, some people just thrive on it, it seems. But I avoid confrontation. And I suppose most people do. But there's some things we cannot avoid. God's called us to attention here. We've received the subpoena and we have to answer. And God has a word for us too. So I guess I can, I can just say it simply. With this case against us that God wants to meet with his goodness and his grace and, and our understanding of his righteousness, we need to respond to that challenge. You can shut down. You can do a number of different things about it. You can say, well, that's not about me. Or, or you can make a complaint. Oh, uh, uh, well, you know, I don't know what complaints you might make, but you, you can avoid this, but I think we cannot avoid it. We can only avoid it at our own peril. God's called us to answer a question this morning, each one of us, in our hearts, in our lives. And I ask you, will we respond to the challenge? Will we plead the case? Will we hear God's case completely? So that's the second, second thing I would say. We, uh, we learn to walk into this good that God desires by responding to the challenge. What was the case? Verse 3, I reflected already how that reminded me of the voice of this woman that was talking about her children. My people, my children, kids, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. You know, sometimes we don't get to have that conversation, but you sure want to. And that's what this whole case is about, God having this conversation with us. So let him speak to us a little bit. God recounted the key points. I read it as clearly and distinctly, just a little bit of background. The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. Bondage. And God sent Moses to deliver them. And he reminds them it was not only Moses, but Aaron and Miriam that helped them through the wilderness. And he reminded them about this issue with Balak and, and the story of Moab. You can, you can look at that story. I, I think uh, without too much trouble, you'll find it over in the book of Numbers around chapter 22, 25, somewhere in there. But uh, Balak was the king of Moab. And when the Israelites came and they're trying to make their way towards the promised land, he wanted to curse them and stop their progress. And he talk, called the local prophet Balak, a Balaam rather, And he said, Balaam, I want you to curse those people. Make sure they don't have any progress. And Balaam said, okay. And God spoke to Balaam and said, no, you don't do that. In fact, not only that, you can't do that. Every time Balaam tried to bring a curse, it turned into a blessing for the people of God. And God says, here's the case I'm presenting. Don't you realize what I've done for you? It's just a couple of anecdotal evidence parts here to let you see what I've done. A a little bit of a case study to see how I've cared for you. And then these two 
cities that he mentions, Shittim and Gilgal, one's on the, on the outskirts of the promised land, Gilgal's in the promised land. And it's a simple image of the fact that I brought you over. The key verse part of that verse is at the end of verse uh, five, is it so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. You know why God does everything that he does? So we'd know him and know how he is righteous and how he is good. In fact, remember he said it in verse eight, and this is the theme of the whole message. He has shown you what is good. Is that true, I wonder? Do you think most people don't understand right and wrong? What it means to hurt somebody versus what it means to do good for someone? Well, maybe that's the pathology of the, of the sociopath or the psychopath or something. But I, I think most people understand what good and bad is. And God has said here to Israel, I've shown you, I've shown you my righteousness, I've shown you good. And so the case doesn't really go all the way to a conclusion as, as I read it. And I remember all the Matlock episodes I've watched and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> um, it, it seems to stop and, and they require a sidebar or something, I, I, I guess. They're, they've stopped and, and counsel has approached the bench. They say, we need to talk about this. I think the Christian sidebar is the cross of Jesus Christ. Where we're looking for a settlement to the disputes, which is redemptive and restorative. And that's exactly what God offers us in the cross. And here it is in Old Testament terms. The following verses. Before we say that, let's just wrap this part of it up. If we're going to walk in and lean into the good that God desires for us, we're going to have to explore our options for grace. I think we are overwhelmed with, if not uh, over preoccupied with other options. We want the technological option. We want the, shall I say it? I can't help but say it. We want the political option. Or the military option or the or you know whatever and that's not to disrespect any politician or military person or anything like that it is simply to tell you that where or to ask you where are our real options for salvation and grace stone silence anybody got a word where are where is our real option for grace in Christ at God's feet Okay, so let's, we're there right now, are we not? We're going to explore our options for grace. So how does this verdict move, or how does this sidebar move ahead? Here it is. Israel in the first person now, uh, as a corporate body, speaking in the first person, we picked it up at verse 6. And they're saying, if I can paraphrase for you, well, how am I going to come to the Lord? How am I going to make God happy in all this? How am I going to defend myself? How am I going to get back into his good graces? I know I'll bring some offerings. I can do a burnt offering. I can bring a year old calf. That's what the law demands. Well, the people in the oligarchs, the people with all the, the people that are running the show financially, they could bring thousands of rams, thousands of rams. The kings of Israel even did that, some of them. If God likes a little sacrifice, maybe he'd like a lot of sacrifice. So let's give him a lot. Maybe a thousand, 10,000 rivers of oil. What if we've expended everything that we can possibly give and do to try to get back in God's graces and it hadn't worked yet? I know we give him a sacrifice of our firstborn child. And God says, no. Don't you remember what I did with Abraham and Isaac? I taught him that that call to, to, to bring Isaac to a sacrifice was something I was really going to supply in this ram. I don't want you to sacrifice your children. And I, I did a little bit of a survey that I think is important for us to, to dig into. It's, I'm going to do them kind of fast because I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight passages of scripture. Here we go. Um, 
I've shown you what's good, what I require of you. What are the three things? You know them. What is it? Do, justice, love, kindness, or mercy, and walk humbly with God. That is, let God lead. That's what a humble walk before God is, letting him lead, right? Okay. Now, this is not... This is such a beautiful flower of uh, revelation in the book of Micah. It stands just beautifully strong and powerful in its statement of God's grace. But it's not alone. And that's what I want you to see by this brief survey. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. How did Moses say we ought to be living? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then Jesus coupled that with a passage from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. He said, don't take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you hear practical application of doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God? In those words? Well, let's go ahead. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 31. Children of Israel trying to make their way out of the wilderness, and, and they, they're tempted to follow the gods of the surrounding nations and sacrifice their children, just like everybody else was doing. And God said, don't get caught like that. Verse 31, he said, you shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God, for every abominable act, act which the Lord hates, they have done to their gods. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Do you think God wants it? No, he's saying as loudly and clearly as he can say it. Then Hosea, the prophet in chapter 6, verse 6, says... God says, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Then in Amos chapter 5, verse 24, um, uh, and actually leading up to it, yeah, this is a real, real strong passage because what he has said is, I don't even get, I don't even enjoy your worship because you're not living right. Essentially, that's what he says. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I'll not even listen to the sound of your harps. I wonder if that applies to the bass guitar. Just saying. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Hallelujah. Do you, think, do you think that this is a theme, perhaps, that we can find in the Old Testament? I think it is. The kicker is Jonah. I always love Jonah's part because here Jonah got swallowed up by that fish you know spit back out excuse me I'm sorry I have to say it that way but that's what happened or regurgitated <laughs> uh, back out there and and he had tried to get away from going to Nineveh because they were enemies but he couldn't get away God would not let him go away and and that's fine um, but you know why he resisted so much Verse chapter 4, verse 2. He, that's Jonah, prayed to the Lord and said, Okay, now, he's already been to Nineveh. He's preached, and they've repented. Okay? And God is on the verge of forgiving them. And Jonah's not sure what's going to happen, but he's suspicious that God's going to forgive them. Forgive them. Verse 2. Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, your forgiveness, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a, get it now, get it, because this is theme, thematic for the Old Testament as well as the New. You are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents, that means changes his mind, concerning calamity. Now, if that's not a strong enough case, listen to the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, as he um, had been criticized for eating with some Pharisees and uh, tax collectors, and uh, you see those who were scrupulous about ritual cleaning and everything like that, about all those laws that brought sacrifice to the fore, they were criticizing Jesus because he ought not be doing that. 
and what happens in uh, chapter 9, verse 12 and following. It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, Jesus answered, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. Guess what? He quotes, he quotes from Hosea, a passage we already read. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The closest thing I can find to a sacrifice of self, uh, other than Jesus saying, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, is Paul in the book of Romans chapter 1, and uh, chapter 12 rather, in verse 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, present your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. That's your spiritual service of worship. Seems like Paul said, don't be doing the violence thing. Just give your life. So, our good God desires good for us and from us. All of his creation. And that would be realized as we do justice, love mercy or kindness, and walk humbly with God. Do I need to say anything else about those three? Somebody told me this week that I need to say, you know, I need to have you respond. This is a big crowd to have a Q&A though. So just you think for a moment, where do you see justice around you? And be reminded that biblical justice, and I think I'm in, in a good theological and biblical position to say it this way, biblical justice is concern for the vulnerable. The key phrase in the Old Testament is the widow and the orphan and the alien. Justice. To love mercy, love kindness. That's, I do want to tease that one out just a second longer because the word that's translated Kindness in New American Standard can also be translated mercy. Oftentimes you see it translated as loving kindness. And it's a wonderful Hebrew word that means more than any of those things. And all of them put together. It is a covenant love. A love of promise. A love that is not predicated by emotion alone. It is made by decision. I'm going to love regardless. Is that the kind of love you desire and love? kind of mercy that you deserve, that love, the kind of kindness, the sort of kindness that I desire. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. And then walk humbly with God. I think I already said that, what I wanted to say about it. That means let God lead. I mean, among other things, you know, if I'm not humble, then I'm the one telling God what to do, right? But if I'm humble before God, I'm going to, I'm going to let him do the leading. And he'll lead me never astray. The hymn of invitation is number 275. And the question that song poses is whether we will surrender all. So as we sing it, we have the opportunity to do that with our lives. Perhaps you need to step out from where you're seated. And, or we'll be standing in just a moment. And come down front and we pray together. And, and uh, see how God's working in our lives too. Be met by such a grace and goodness as redeems people from Egypt and slavery and restores us because of the forgiveness of the cross. To be confronted by that begs, calls, pleads, says, what have I done to you to act otherwise than to do justice, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with, with God? That's something I think we have to deal with. It is the word of God for the people of God. Hymn number 275, I Surrender All. Let's stand together, sing, pray, come as God leads you. Be faithful to what he's calling you to do.